We are back on Inside Politics today. Our guest is Vanderbilt Law Professor Michael Newton. Uh, he's an expert in war crimes. He's also an expert in sort of how countries should be waging war in a legal way against each other. as such a thing. Uh, Professor Newton, I think the question a lot of people have is, in this age of, of uh, total war, which may have begun as early as the Civil War, but certainly World War One, World War Two, it appears everything goes. So why should anybody have these kind of rules? Because it doesn't appear they're always followed. Oh, that's true. There will always be violations in every armed conflict. But the, the core foundational principle, the cornerstone of this entire field is in the 1863 Libra Code in the midst of what you described as a total war which said that the right of waging war is not unlimited. That's what the law of war does. It gives you the legal limits and people get prosecuted for it from the low ranking to the generals and sometimes the presidents and prime ministers get prosecuted. The law is very clear here. In what I have read in the story that appears that the sanctions that are in place against Russia already, at least in terms of the ICC investigation, they may need to stay in place indefinitely. Um, until this matter is completely done, is, is there some connection, is there going to be some connection between these sanctions staying in place and I guess continuing to be effective and when the hostilities end? Um, I doubt it, but one of the interesting things about the International Criminal Court, the ICC that you referred to, is that they also have the ability to seize people's personal assets um, on behalf of the court, the criminal court. Um, I remember Ali Hassan al-Majid was defiant to the trial until the judge told him that we're going to seize your assets. That got his attention. I think that will be one of the critical things that will get the attention of Russian oligarchs in the criminal process on the criminal side. Uh, in terms of what's going on with this particular war, you, you have a military background, so you, you know the power and the dangerous nature. Of, of warfare. Are you concerned as you're starting to see, particularly with Russia, a, a pattern? Because this has happened in Syria and other places they've intervened in recent years. And they are, there are other Soviet, former Soviet states around there too. Are you concerned that this is going to continue, not just in Ukraine, but in other parts of the world? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Russian tactics, the one that really concerns me the most are intentional attacks directed against civilians. So there's a humanitarian convoy. Civilians are starving. And to be clear, starvation of civilians as a method of war is an absolute war crime. And when, negotiations, when negotiators have set up humanitarian convoys for food and for medicine and for people to evacuate, the Russians have a habit of shelling those convoys. Uh, they've done it in Russia, they've done it in, I'm sorry, Syria, they've done it in Grozny in the Chechen war, et cetera, repeatedly. I think that's one of the things that we as the world need to stand up united um, I'm not a big fan of no-fly zones, but I absolutely would, would have air cover over a humanitarian convoy. I, and, and the other thing I think we should do is to put radio transponders on the ground that will automatically return fire. In other words, we can vector artillery fire into any artillery that fires into a humanitarian convoy. We've got to stand on behalf of starving civilians. We're dealing with a leader in Russia who doesn't like to lose, we understand, and, and obviously he's not it's not going the way he wants it to go. Are you concerned we're dealing with somebody who may not be uh, completely balanced completely? Are we looking at the, the need to have to basically remove him from power before you can even start to do any kind of prosecutions on war crimes? That would be the, I mean, to pro, war crimes prosecutions in the past have been based on a change of political power. Charles Taylor being one example in Sierra Leone, uh, of course, Milosevic and, and former Republic of Yugoslavia, and there are other examples. Uh, but not necessarily. I mean, right now there's a military problem, and I, I want to emphasize the collection of war crimes evidence during the war is vitally important. We started this in World War II in a rudimentary way. We're much better at doing it now. We have to be aggressive in doing that before we even begin to talk about criminal cases. The video you have is probably pretty good that you can see for what's been out there. Are there other things you need? Are people need to be on the ground monitoring this thing and, and capturing this? Are, are these the, the combatants or are these other people that might come from these organizations to do this investigation? All of the above. I mean, I call this an all of the free world approach. Um, in, in Syria, we had civil groups that filled the vacuum. Um, we had local leadership that filled the vacuum. So the video sometimes is misleading, and you always have to have corroborating evidence. You always have to authenticate that video. Even if it does show a war crime, it doesn't show you the intent. It doesn't show you the context. It doesn't show you the circumstances, and that's what we've got to do is build a criminal case very carefully. We can't just stand up and say, these are war crimes. That's genocide. We have to prove it in a court of law, and that takes a great deal of coordinated effort. 
I don't know if this technology would be used, but here in the United States, there's a lot of uh, technology that goes on to look, for, look at emails and things like that in criminal investigations. Does the investigations by either these bodies, the, the ICC or the World Court, likely to be going into taking that kind of, uh, of, of uh, a action to try to get those kind of electronic documents and other things to prove their case? Yes, sir. I mean, one of the critical pieces of evidence in the Milosevic trial was tele intercepted telephone communications between people in the field. Or, you know, you may well see in the digital age emails or orders to the field, all of the above. And it takes all of the above, but it also takes a very sophisticated analytical team that recognizes the specific legal importance for each and every element of each and every offense charge. Professor, this, this is long, it's painstaking. Professor Newton, thank you so much for being with us. I suspect given the complexity of this and how long it may go on, we'll have you back on the show earlier. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you, Pat. And thank you for joining us on Inside Politics. Hope you're back here again for a future show. If you can't get enough politics in the meantime, you can go to the News Channel 5 website. You'll find my capital new commentary there. A new commentary every posted every Friday afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.